Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and I'm outside the Scottish Rite Cathedral in St. Louis, Missouri. If you missed our first two videos with the tour of this pipe organ, you can see it down in the description below. But now, you're probably asking, who are the Scottish Rite? Why do they need such a strange organ? Well, fortunately, I know the exact right person to ask that question to. Andrew Schaefer is an organist in Madison, Wisconsin. He's very passionate about the Scottish Rite and its music. In fact, he's just completed a dissertation on the Scottish Rite organ in America and its history. Andrew is himself a Scottish Rite Mason, so he is the perfect person to tell us all about this organ, this institution, the Masons, and everything you need to know about the Scottish Rite. Greetings. As Brent mentioned, I am Andrew Schaefer, and it is a delight to be here at the St. Louis Scottish Rite to not only talk about this magnificent building, but to talk about this very unique Kimball organ. Certainly unique among Scottish Rite organs in the United States, but also unique among pipe organs in the world. There's, there's um, very few instruments like it, and I can't wait to share that story with you. It was designed by Richard Peer Elliott, who worked for several organ building companies uh, throughout the course of his career. He was really a maverick. Uh, I think he worked for Granville Wood, Farron and Vote, Austin, Wurlitzer, and of course Kimball, and I believe he worked for Welty. And um, some of you can um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong if I've got that list wrong. But uh, again, a very prolific builder um, a figure in organ building throughout the early 20th century. He designed this particular organ. Uh, and he designed it to be unique. And if any of you have taken a look at the specifications, watched part of the video series, or even um, been lucky enough to come here to the temple and sit at the console, you're probably thinking to yourself, what in the world is this organ? There's a lot of things that um, suggest it's a classical organ. You look at the, the, um, the draw knob console, uh, a lot of the stop nomenclature is um, very standard concert organ um, setup. But then you'll see a few stops that are suggestive of theater organs, like Nura or Tibia, or the, the bird calls on it, the castanets, the piano. Wondering, what in the world is this? Well, it was designed um, because the Masons didn't want it to make up its mind. It was called to do um, very serious uh, classical literature and to play very serious moments but it also had to have a light-hearted side and to have a versatile side to respond to what goes on in Masonic ritual. I'm going to get to some of that a little bit later in the video but I kind of wanted to throw that out there. I wanted to say a little bit about the dedication of this particular organ all of which um, these events took place in 1924. It happened over three nights. On Wednesday night uh, they had the opening concert and they, they brought in um, Charles Corbon from New York City to play a program. This program was open to all Scottish Rite Masons and their families. And believe it or not, this 3200 seat auditorium was packed to capacity and uh, newspaper accounts from the day say they had to set up chairs uh, on the floor just to accommodate the overflowing crowds. The very next night, he played yet another program. Uh, that was a Thursday night. And this program was open to all uh, Master Masons and their families. And again, the auditorium was filled to um, overflowing capacity. Now you may be wondering, well, all Masons and their families, I thought that um, Scottish Rite Masons were Masons as well. And that is very true. They are Masons. Um, all Scottish Rite um, members are Masons, but not all Masons are members of the Scottish Rite. So they wanted to share this with the wider Masonic community. Finally, on the, the last night, which was a Friday night, they had the big grand opening. And this in the program, it says, um, for the people of St. Louis. 
And so they wanted a, a broad cross-section of the city. And at this program, the organ was featured very heavily, and at times in conjunction with the St. Louis Symphony. They had um, an A-list of um, local celebrities, including the mayor, the former governor of Missouri, I think the secretary of education, maybe for the entire United States, the conductor of the St. Louis Symphony. They all gave speeches talking about how masonry interacted with, with the culture of St. Louis and why this building and, and this organization was so important for the cultural life of St. Louis. So who were these Masons? Who are these Masons? Um, they're still uh, very active here in the United States. What is this building doing here? And, and what is the story behind this curious organ? It's a complicated one. It's a very interesting one. It's one that I can't wait to tell you. But I think it's best told um, as we journey throughout this magnificent building. And we'll head back up here to the console uh, at the very end. So all you organ nerds, I have something for you at the end too. So, all right, we'll start our tour. Well, here we are in the library, We're two floors down from the mighty Kimball organ. And I thought this would be a wonderful setting to talk about the fraternity in general. I don't think there's any other organization in the United States that is so widely known culturally, yet so little understood as, as Freemasonry is. The fraternity does have some roots in the medieval stonemason guilds, um, but the speculative kind of masonry um, really started um, a few hundred years later. And history is a little fuzzy about exactly where and when uh, the first lodges appeared and how this movement got started. But here in the United States, uh, it predated the Revolutionary War. A lot of people probably know that many of our founding fathers were Freemasons. Um, probably the most famous among them is George Washington. And in fact, when he laid the um, cornerstone at the U.S. Capitol, he did so in full Masonic regalia and put on a Masonic ceremony to do so. And if you go to Washington, D.C., um, there's a lot of interesting um, Masonic monuments that you can take in. It predated the Revolutionary War, but it became very popular in the um, latter part of the 18th century. However, in the early part of the 19th century, Freemasonry um, declined quite a bit. This was due to a few factors, but chief among them was the fact that there was a religious movement afoot in the United States that um, really discouraged um, the Freemasonry and all sorts of other uh, fraternal orders. They didn't just pick on Masons, but um, Masons definitely took a brunt of that. But also um, something called the William Morgan Affair, and I won't get into the details in this video. You can, um, if you're watching this on a computer, uh, open up a new tab and, and Google it. Um, but it was not a factual thing that happened, but it was something that really hurt uh, the organization in general. The fraternity almost went extinct around the time of the Civil War until it enjoyed a little bit of a resurgence in the uh, late part of the 19th century. Going into the 20th century, the fraternity really exploded in growth after World War I as all of these men came home from Europe seeking um, fellowship as well as connections uh, within the wider business world and the political and cultural world of where they lived. You have to remember a lot of very powerful people were Masons. And so this was, this was a way to, for ordinary men to really kind of rub elbows with, with congressmen and, and mayors and things like that. And that's when buildings like this were, were built. And they were built in response to that initial big bump after World War I. The Depression did a, a horrible number on the fraternity as it did to many, many other organizations. 
um, and membership again plummeted and a lot of um, these beautiful buildings um, uh, were almost lost to the bank because the Masons couldn't continue making mortgage payments. They thought that the membership boom would continue through the 1930s, um, but again, little do they know the Depression would re would derail that. Just as things were starting to turn around in the Depression, of course, World War II strikes. And that takes a lot of men that would have joined the fraternity and ships them off to Europe, further weakening the fraternity. When they came home from Europe, um, history repeated itself. They um, started to join these lodges to not only make friends uh, and, and to learn about this wonderful organization, but also to make um, wider connections as they were trying to rebuild their lives after spending um, you know, tours of duty in Europe. That led to a membership boom, um, as mentioned, and by the late 1950s and early 60s, the fraternity had over four million men. Since then, unfortunately, um, the fraternity has declined uh, pretty much every year since the early 1960s. However, there are still over a million Masons in the United States today, all over the country. And chances are, if, um, if you look them up, you'll find a beautiful Masonic building in your community that a group of men are, are looking to take care of. So that's a little bit about the history of the fraternity. Um, I think it'd be interesting to go up to the lodge room now, tell you a little bit more about their ritual. Here we are in the lodge room. I thought this would be a wonderful place to talk about Masonic ritual. This is where um, you begin your Masonic journey, but it's also where the bulk of Freemasonry takes place. When you enter the fraternity, you do so as an entered apprentice. After that, you get your fellow craft degree, and then finally, you become a master mason. If you've ever heard the phrase, giving someone the third degree, well, that has its roots in Freemasonry. Um, and because the third degree is a very difficult one um, to obtain. In order to pass through these degrees, you go through initiation ceremonies. And this room is um, symbolic of a Masonic journey. And there are chairs in very strategic locations. And behind me is actually where um, the worshipful master of the lodge, uh, which is the highest uh, position, sits. These are elected every year by the membership and it changes um, through. While Freemasonry does have a different power structure, as I mentioned, it also has, um, it's also based on the idea or as they would say, the level of equality. So as I mentioned, to get these degrees, you go through the initiation ceremonies, you go on um, a series of journeys um, throughout this room, and then you spend time memorizing um, all of the ritual that uh, you've just experienced so that you know how to behave in a lodge and you know how, um, how you understand um, the different parts of the ritual. And after you've memorized that degree, that's when you can go on and get your next one. And when I say degrees, they are sort of like um, a college degree, but they're different. I mean, you think of degrees more in terms of geometry, which is very important um, to Masons. So once you get your Master Mason degree, you are free to go join what are called appendant bodies in masonry. There are several. Uh, the three of the biggest um, are the Shriners, you know, the, the funny guys with the hats and the little cars that drive around at parades. Um, they also put on the circus, so uh, we, and they sponsor the children's hospital, so they do a lot of philanthropic work and, and have a lot of fun doing it. There are also two other organizations, the York Rite, and you guessed it, the Scottish Rite. The Scottish Rite is considered sort of the um, university of masonry, as it were. 
Um, that's where you go to further your, um, your Masonic education. And you learn more about the, um, the philosophy and the guiding principles of the organization. And so, as I said, you get degrees four through 32. So when you hear someone's a 32nd degree Mason, that means that they are a member of the Scottish Rite. There's actually a degree on top of that, the, um, the 33rd degree, and that's given to people who have been members for a very long time and have shown um, a lot of loyalty to the organization. Masonry is not just for men. Um, there are women's organizations, which um, encompass Amaranth and Eastern Star. And they are open to all women. You do not have to be a wife of a Mason or anything like that to join. There are also a Masonic organizations for children. For boys, you can join Demole, or for girl, uh, you can join Job's Daughters. Uh, music plays a very important part in Masonry. Masons hold music in exceedingly high regard. It's one of the seven liberal arts and sciences. A lot of lodge rooms in smaller towns have pianos, but it's really common for Masonic buildings to have small pipe organs in lodge rooms. This particular lodge room does not have a pipe organ. Uh, the Kimball is more than enough for this building. But if you have an old Masonic temple downtown where you live, uh, it was built in the 1920s, there is a better than even chance that there is some old uh, Muller or Kimball uh, or Wangren, uh, in the case of where I live in Madison, <coughs> sitting in the um, Temple Lodge Room. And uh, you know, if you are an Oregon fan, call up the, the lodge, see if they have one and, and, uh, and go play it. And now we're going to head down to the auditorium where you'll hear a little bit more about the Scottish Rite degrees in particular. So here we are in the vast auditorium. As I mentioned earlier at the console, seats 3,200 people, which is probably considered maybe just right in 1924 when this building was built. You can see this beautiful setting here. It looks like a Christian cathedral behind me. This is one of dozens and dozens. There are perhaps almost a hundred hand-painted backdrops um, in the fly space above the stage. So what exactly is this backdrop doing here? Why do they have hundreds of backdrops? Well, it's because Scottish Rite degrees are actually presented as plays, as works of theater. It wasn't always like this. In fact, the man who is kind of responsible for the modern day Scottish Rite, a man by the name of Albert Pike, did not envision it this way. He um, intended for candidates individually to go through the 29 degrees and to have them tailored and to be, a, like I said, a personal experience. Well, it takes a lot of manpower to put on 29 degrees and a lot of time. And they were faced with bulging membership. And so over time, as um, Pike died, leaders of the Scottish Rite started to experiment with presenting the degrees in a more theatrical way. And it actually started in the northern jurisdiction. Um, and I should mention there are two jurisdictions of the Scottish Rite, the northern, um, and none of the geographic um, <laughs> regions make sense, uh, the northern and then the southern jurisdiction but the southern jurisdiction actually starts um, uh, everything north of the Mason-Dixon line and everything west of the Mississippi River. So there are a lot of northern states in the southern jurisdiction, but I won't get into that. But anyway, this started in the northern jurisdiction in the Valley of Chicago. And initially it wasn't really anything too, like I said, dramatic. It was just um, having multiple candidates at a time um, and it was done in the lodge room, but um, again, they, they did short allegorical plays. Well, this idea just kind of kept snowballing. 
as Scottish right, more and more Scottish right buildings were built and they were getting bigger and bigger. And they had more amenities like electricity that they could afford to put on larger productions. Also, the membership was continuing to boom. And so classes got bigger and bigger and bigger. And valleys just started to keep upping their game by building bigger and bigger stages, buying more and more costumes, and commissioning more scenery. Now, Scottish Rite Valleys around the country are unique in that they're one of the only places in the United States where you can go and see scenery, actual working scenery, that's almost 100 years old. Typically in theaters, scenery is discarded um, after the show is done, you know, because they don't have tons of fly space available. But because the degrees are repeated, the plays are repeated over and over and over again, they have this wonderful thing. Well, 29 plays, roughly an hour each, that's a lot of theater to sit through. So Scottish Rites came up with the idea of reunions. Masons would come from all around the surrounding area to come to the Scottish Rite. And like I said, individual Masonic lodges are littered in every small town in America. But there are generally fewer, fewer Scottish rites because, again, the idea was that they would pull all these Masons in. That's why this building is so big. It's not necessarily just for the city of St. Louis. It was to serve um, a large portion of the state of Missouri and into Illinois. So, in order to present all of these plays, these reunions would take, be multi-day events. And during the heyday of when these buildings were built, um, going through the 1960s, reunions were typically offered um, two to four times a year to accommodate all the people. And they would come for probably about three to five days. They would bring um, sometimes their families with them. They would travel great distances to come. And even some temples, including this one, have dormitories where the men could stay, the candidates could stay for free on site. Today, um, Scottish Rites still present their degrees during reunions. Typically, they'll have them uh, twice a year, but they still put on the full um, theatrical productions, complete with costumes and with this magnificent scenery. Now that you know how um, reunions are conducted and how these plays are put on, it's time to go back up to the mighty Kimball. Well, here we are back at the magnificent Kimball console. I hope you've enjoyed your tour of the building. Now that you know a little bit more about the Scottish Rite, and how these degrees were presented, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how these organs are used in the degrees. So when this organ was installed, there was a choir here at the temple. And you can see uh, behind the console, there's um, space for a choir of about, I don't know, 20, 25 people. These choirs sang all sorts of different literature. They would sing um, sacred music, they would sing uh, secular music and sometimes music that was written with Masonic texts that would fit the degrees. I'm not quite sure historically, but if I were a betting man, I would say that the St. Louis Scottish Rite had a all-male choir because it's right out in the open. Uh, they have a clear view of the stage and, and the audience can see them. And of course, with that in mind, they all had to be Scottish Rite Masons to sing in the choir. But that's not true of every valley. Some valleys, some other Scottish rites, had um, choirs that um, had sopranos and altos um, using women's voices. You might wonder, well, how did that work? Well, they came up with a very clever workaround for this. Um, and I've seen a few temples throughout the country that utilize this. Uh, and two that pop to my mind um, are the valleys of Guthrie, Oklahoma and McAllister, Oklahoma. Both of those valleys have Kimball pipe organs 
that are installed actually up in the ceilings above the stage. Uh, in the Guthrie instance, it's in the proscenium arch. In the McAllister, it's about uh, uh, 60 feet up in the air, um, up in the attic, and it speaks through a tone chute. In those two temples, they actually have a separate choir loft that's high up in the ceiling. And the choir sings through a grill, um, like I said, towards, towards the ceiling. It creates a very ethereal effect. But because it's up there, um, they can only be, be heard. They cannot be seen. Likewise, if you're up in that loft, you really can't see anything that's going on in the stage underneath. You get a great view of the ceiling, and it's not for you if you are afraid of heights. But you also can't hear what's going on downstairs because the stage is directly below you. So it's kind of an interesting workaround. And they actually have um, ladies' lounges <laughs> high, high up in these temples so that the, um, the choristers could take breaks and uh, relax in between the degrees while they, they set up. And some of these temples actually had duplicate organ consoles that could be um, used in conjunction with the choir. So uh, in the case of uh, Guthrie, there's a separate console up there um, that's completely independent of the one downstairs. I believe the Joplin Scottish Rite has this arrangement too, where the choir sings in a remote room next to the auditorium. It's kind of piped in in a certain way, and there's a duplicate console in there um, to facilitate playing. So they went through great lengths <laughs> to make this um, arrangement work. The organs were also used um, for other purposes during reunion weekends. As I mentioned earlier, uh, these were family affairs, uh, and, and uh, people would travel great distances. And so when the degree work was done for the day, uh, sometimes the temples would put on shows and other entertainment, and the organ would be there to lead um, the, the assembly, the, the families of Masons, in sing-alongs and in choral programs and in other plays and patriotic programs. The list goes on and on, but they, they came up with all sorts of creative ways to use the organ. So it had to be a highly versatile instrument to respond to all these needs. Over the years, as the fraternity has, um, has declined, that has really infected the music um, programs in many of these valleys. I do not know of a single valley uh, in the United States that still has a temple choir per se. They may have soloists do things here and there, um, but choir, Masonic choirs are kind of a thing of the past. And I know in Guthrie, they um, disbanded the choir in the 1960s. And um, a, a kindly older Mason who was a member there for many, many years and remembers that temple choir put it a little more um, in an uncharitable light and said they, they were put out of their misery. Apparently it was <laughs> not a very good choir. But all this to say, uh, as the choirs um, uh, decreased in importance, uh, the role of the organist actually increased. And so uh, while they could provide less incidental music, it was left up to the organist to fill the void. Every Scottish Rite Valley is different. And as I mentioned, there's a northern jurisdiction and a southern jurisdiction. And their degrees are a little, um, are, are very similar in nature, but they, they present them in different ways. And every valley has a different way of presenting those degrees within that framework. Some valleys um, use the organ rather sparingly, um, simply as uh, candidates or, or masons are, are walking in and out of the room, they'll provide some incidental music, and maybe once or twice in a degree or two uh, will they have a role to play. Other valleys, like the Valley of McAllister and Guthrie, as I mentioned, um, have the organ play a much more um, active role in the degrees. Uh, in, in fact, they, the organ usually plays softly underneath all of the speaking and sort of adds a little bit of life to these plays. These, I said the candidates watch 29 degrees um, over the course <laughs> of a few days. So it's hard to concentrate for some of that, and sometimes the organ um, provides a little bit of, of life and, um, and, dare I say, keeps them awake for some of these degrees. 
So that's why you would find um, a tibia um, um, resting, in a canura resting beside, um, say, something a little bit more generic, like a regular gedect um, or a fagato, that you really wouldn't find too much in theater organs. And that is because they were called to play for these degrees, to play for sing-alongs. Um, to play for patriotic programs. And occasionally silent movies um, in the 1920s were shown um, at, as part of reunion weekends. So they had to be highly versatile organs. And um, I believe that um, the Kimball Company in this particular case uh, really stepped it up and provided an organ that's unlike any in the United States and indeed the world. In the 1960s and 70s, it started to really show its age, and um, it was the product of some um, unfortunate caretakers over the years. By the turn of the 21st century, the organ was in a really rough shape and barely playable. Truth be told, the Scottish Rite here had serious thoughts about selling it uh, and nearly sold it to Indiana University at one point. IU sent some folks down here to get it playing again, um, including John Schwant and um, Clark Wilson. And the Masons were able to hear this organ in at least part of its glory. And it lit a spark under them to say, you know, this organ is really integral to this building and to our history here in St. Louis, and we really need to preserve it. I'm delighted that um, Al Haker got on the scene and in 2004, he started to make some uh, very minor repairs and try to get it um, um, going again. But he um, more importantly convinced the Valley in 2011 that it was time to spend a little bit um, more money and, and do a more focused campaign to get this to play again. If you are um, ever in the St. Louis area, you know, I encourage you to try to come visit Call them up. These folks here are always um, excited to show the building, and certainly Al is always excited to show this organ off. Um, it's a real jewel, and I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about masonry in general, about organs and masonry. And if you have any questions about um, masons and pipe organs, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thanks again for watching. So I hope that answers a lot of your questions about the Scottish Rite, the organ here, why they have this instrument, and how it's used in, its, uh, in their daily work. Now, Andrew and I first talked about visiting this organ when he was writing his dissertation. He used this instrument as well as some others in other cities uh, as his research, and we talked about doing an entire series of just Scottish Rite organs. Unfortunately, the pandemic kind of slowed us down in that regard. We haven't been able to get out to visit any other cities and see any other organs, so uh, that sh project was shelved until recently when we decided we really needed to come visit this pipe organ. Reason being is the pandemic hasn't just hit us, it's hit the Masons as well. Normally they rent out this building for concerts and graduations and dance contests and all sorts of things throughout the year. Well, they haven't been able to do that this year and that has caused some financial strain. And as a result, they have decided to put this building up for sale. That means the building, the lot, the organ, everything uh, is all up for grabs right now. What that means for the future of the organ, we don't really know. We're just still waiting to find out. There is a uh, university right behind here, across the street, that has a history of buying up property in the neighborhood uh, for future expansion. Perhaps they might save it, but they also don't have a great record of building preservation in this neighborhood, and they certainly don't have a great record of pipe organ preservation. Who knows, though, maybe somebody seeing this video will be able to uh, come to the rescue. Maybe it'll have a uh, new life as a performing arts center, or perhaps the organ will go on to a new home somewhere else. Only time will tell. My thanks to Stephen Ball, Andrew Schaefer, and especially Al Haker for all the work he did in making this video possible. He was instrumental in us being here inside the building and seeing the organ. My thanks also to Brett Akers and all of the Scottish Rite Masons who uh, allowed us in the building when it's otherwise completely locked down. I hope you enjoyed that video. Please click the thumbs up if you did, and uh, make sure you're subscribed to our channel because we do hope there will be new videos coming out very soon.
Until then, you can always get streaming classical organ music on our three channels, OrganLive.com, Positively Baroque, and The Organ Experience. Everyone have a great new year. I hope to see you in 2021 with new videos. Until then, take care.